Uh, so I'm Aaron. I ran for state rep in Somerville last year. And um, considering uh, things down the road as well, um, a big, a big one for me is electoral reform. Adam will be speaking the ranked choice voting, uh, which is very important for me. But one of the main ones I'm really focused on is um, talking about false slogans, this idea that we the people are in control of our government. We, we really aren't. It is, I mean, it's big corporations that we're really going against and big money and big, um, we don't have any say on implementation of policy. We are at the whims of folks that win elections. And like at this point right now, people are writing laws. And really, what say do we the people have in the implementation of these laws? I mean, I'm thinking of question four with marijuana legalization. And now we look at what's going on at the State House, and we're at the whims of our elected leaders. And we have lost the ability for us, the people, to have any say in how this law is implemented. And we've got to start looking at ways when past elections that were not left there, I look at it as like bowing to our leaders. Like we go into the office, we're knocking on their doors, we're making phone calls to our leaders, trying to get just two minutes of face time with them so we can explain how we're viewing a situation. Then we walk out of our elected rep's uh, office. What power do we have? So we need, some, we need to be looking at ways that we can almost be looking at ballot questions in between elections. So we can say when it came to they postponed the legal date for marijuana, like seven state, uh, five, six state reps, three state senators decided that they were going to take it upon themselves to change question four a little bit. A handful of elected reps decided the course of question four not the people of Massachusetts. And this happens time and time and time again. Uh, so that's, that's one of my main focuses is on between elections, how the people can have more of a say in the implementation of laws. Uh, but also more importantly of elections is we are, everyone in this room is capable of running for office. And I honestly believe if this were a body of gov government, us in this room, we would come up with better results and what's coming out of the state house. And uh, we've got to be, uh, we are all, and, I, and that's just one of the things I want, I hope folks leave here. We are all capable of a state rep position. And, and our government wants us to think it's above us. The issues are so complex that we are incapable of reading information and getting the factual information and understanding the issues that it's just so complex that it's, we've, we've, got, to, we've got to leave it to them. That's not the case. This country was founded by people like you and I. Mercenaries, builders, construction workers, cafe workers. And there's no different today. We are the backbone of our country, of our state, and of our government. And um, the more big money and, and influence that money has on our politics, uh, and I did find what you were saying very interesting. Um, I've had my back and forth on Citizen United and whatnot. At the end of the day, Enron and these, these huge corporations don't have my interests at heart. And when they pile up money, and, and when you have a handful of corporations, seven or eight corporations that are pretty much controlling everything, our mainstream media and whatnot, that, um, so, so the problem really isn't corporations, it's a select few of them that are at the very top who are controlling and buying elections, which ranked choice voting will help, uh, will help uh, limit uh, the amount of influence that uh, a lot of these folks have. But it, it's a start, starting point, and we've gotta be looking at ways that we can get some power back in between elections and have some say in implementation of things. And that's kind of my main focus. Not a lot of research, but what I, the research I did do says that I would have to really, you know, read that through. If they have an appointed board, that could be a, a real problem. Well, they're, what they're doing is, it sounds like they're, they're in, I mean, I've, we're in active discussions with them in terms of this reform. That's the American Promise um, initiative. Maybe representatives put that on their website. And they're working with them because we're thinking about combining a few different powerful democracy reforms in one package. Um, Represent Us's package 
is a slew of, um, you know, this revolving door loophole. So requiring a cooling off period, I think of four years, or something pretty significant when you stop working in Congress uh, before you start working we on K have Street. Some, so. We already have some cooling off periods, but right now I think it's more like Yeah, yeah. So there's, so, and there's all sorts of stuff. Anyway, do. I don't want to get into the weeds of each thing. There's a lot of things to talk about. So the, the uh, check them out, represent.us, really great stuff. You can read their whole anti-corruption act. Um, now, I was thinking about, uh, all right, so let's, let's, so the clean elections thing, the only person sitting in, con in, in the State House right now is Senator Jamie Eldridge. He ran under this system. Uh, he's out front on a lot of issues. You might not agree with him politically in some of the stuff. He's, he's got a lot of kind of social welfare bent to some of his stuff, but he's very progressive. He's, and, and in terms of transparency, ethics, uh, anti-corruption, he's top notch. Um, this reform was passed by the people of Massachusetts, two to one, they voted for it two to one. It was a huge campaign, very grassroots. The legislature adopted it. The Speaker of the House at the time, Tom Finner, hated it. Uh, they ran a ballot question, purely advisory, and they have the privilege to just run an advisory question before the people, and said, do you want taxpayer money to fund political campaigns in Massachusetts? With no context of five years ago that we already passed this, with context, with a whole re regime and a program that people could read on their ballot. So people voted two to one, no, we do not want to fund political campaigns with taxpayer money. So he, so Finneran and the gang used that as their justification to eventually defund, refuse to fund the law that they had already had to pass because of the ballot in 98, and eventually piecemeal through a series of voice votes, repeal it wholesale, get it off the books. Uh, it was a, it's, it's an interesting saga in our political history that everyone in this room should be aware of if you're interested in corruption. And uh, it's, it's knocked the wind out of the sails of a lot of reformers in the state. So it's been about 12, 13 years now. <clears throat> um, and so there's still a little bit of talk of going back for public financing, but the worry is there's still strong opposition that would do the same kind of tricks. So I'm not sure what the answer is for that, but it's just good to know. Um, maybe it's civil disobedience, who knows, uh, when the legislature goes too far uh, and, and thwarts our will. Okay, so here's... So even if we got money out of politics and we had a, a, a renaissance of civic engagement where, where you know, tons of people are running for office, as you said, anybody can run um, for state rep. It you know, might cost you between ten dollars and $30,000, which isn't a huge amount of money. Yeah, it depends on the districts. It depends on how, you know, how um, your opposition, how strong your incumbent is. But it's possible, and there's some really good political consultants out there that specialize in beating incumbents. Mike Connolly just beat in 26 Middlesex in Cambridge Somerville, my district, just beat a, tw a 26 year incumbent, uh, Tim Toomey. And everyone said it wasn't possible. He ran one time as No Money Mike, he got 30 some percent. He ran again and he, and he beat him uh, with a healthy, I think by 7% or something. Uh, he's, uh, Mike, Mike is really out front on a lot of good issues. Uh, again, ethics and transparency. Um, so it's possible. All right. Even if we have this renaissance where all these people are running, we have some big, big problems with our voting system, and that is vote splitting and spoiler candidates. And uh, this notion of we have, to, we have to choose the lesser of two evils, we have to compromise our true values, uh, we feel like we're throwing our vote away if we want to vote for an independent or a third party or a candidate who might not be quite as popular but does align with our, with our views. Um, so um, I guess my name is Adam Friedman. Um, uh, I'm a civic technologist, that's my day job. So I create uh, databases of election results statistics that I license to state governments. And I'm working also on licensing this uh, software to uh, counties and municipal governments. I created the first ever pu comprehensive, publicly accessible uh, database of election history in Massachusetts that went live in 2012. Uh, it covers 46 years of historical elections. Any, any election, any ballot question that's reported to the Secretary is on the site. So if you're interested in electoral politics or running, this is a good place to start with research. Uh, and um, so the problem that we're going to be talking about is plurality voting and the solution being ranked choice voting. And then I'll get to our campaign. I'll try to speed through because a lot of you already know ranked choice voting. And let me know if you want me to just like keep going or whatever. Raise your hand through to interrupt me if you have a question. Um, so we started a 501c3, Voter Choice Massachusetts. Um, we are a politically safe space. So we have people from progressive Democrats, libertarians, Republicans, Trump supporters, anybody and everybody is welcome because we're all united for a common cause to 
fundamentally overhaul our voting system to make it fairer for everyone. Uh, and uh, so the problem uh, is the classic case is the Nader Gore Bush example in Florida and the presidential in 2000. Um, so keep going. So B Bush and Gore uh, had a 537 vote difference. Um, Bush won the election, won Florida, won the election. Uh, Nader had almost 100,000 votes. So if Nader had not been in the race, it's very likely that the, uh, the very outcome would have changed. And it's not just that voters are thwarted when they want to vote third party or what have you. It's also that we're giving so much power uh, to, a, to a, a relatively unpopular candidate. It, you know, we could talk about why, but in terms of the numbers that don't lie in this, well, they kind of lie because people are suppressed. They can't really vote their honest values. Um, why should one man be the kingmaker? This is called the kingmaker scenario. So by him deciding to enter or to not enter the race, he's, he's basically saying, if I enter, I want Bush to win. If I don't enter, Gore's going to win. So that actually gives all the power to this one person. Very anti-democracy. Uh, very dangerous. Um, there was a case, because it's dangerous and it could be dirty, because there was, there, there's cases where people can bring in ringer candidates for the strategic purpose of splitting the vote off of their opponent candidate. And this happened, uh, I think it was 2010, in Arizona, there was a Republican going around soliciting um, from homeless people to have them go to run for a, uh, a utilities board as Green Party candidates to thwart Democratic opponents. So they would just, just by being on the ballot as a Green, they're going to siphon off some percentage of voters who would otherwise have voted Democratic. So if our elections are that insecure that anybody can game the system like that and change the outcome, that needs to be fixed immediately. Next slide. And so we're blaming people. We're blaming the people who run, like the Ralph Nader, being a spoiler. <clears throat> and we have evidence here that clearly Gore would have won because the, the plurality that most voters who did vote for Nader would have voted for Gore, some fraction for Bush, and some would not have, would, would, would have voted at all. And that, and that last statistic, that 28% speaks to this, this cynicism, disaffection, alienation from our system uh, that um, we can't vote our values, so we just stay home. Again, anathema to democracy, completely un-American, not what we stand for, but this is what's happening. And we saw it in this last election, too. Bernie couldn't, you know, Bernie, if he had ran as an independent, he probably should have been an independent, because he's been an independent most of his career, he would have spoiled the election for Hillary Clinton, so of course it would be political suicide for him to, for him to do that. Maybe there's, yeah, and so he didn't do that, and what, what we had was millions of, of Democratic voters did not show up. Uh, and, that, and if he did run, that could have changed the outcome as well. We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have a Trump presidency today. Uh, example in Massachusetts, Coakley, Grossman, and Berwick for the Democratic primary. Grossman and Berwick, uh, next slide. Um, it can be argued, next slide, that they shared the progressive side of the spectrum here uh, and split the vote because they were both in the race. So we have a more mainstream, moderate candidate, Coakley, going up against the Republican Charlie Baker and losing because she just wasn't that strong of a candidate but she got the plurality. So the argument, this is important, if you're, if you're into this reform already, ranked choice voting, this is an important case because it's an argument to convince the party in power in this state, which is, which are? Dem, Dems, yeah. What percentage of the legislature do the Dems control? How many seats? 80. 80 what? 80. 80, is it that high? I think it's 85, 80, 80 85, whatever. So. 80 to 90. That's pretty bad. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's really bad. Yeah. Uh, so for us to do what we're going to do, uh, ideally, you know, maybe a ballot question. We're not sure yet. We're still deciding our strategy. We need to really get the Democratic Party um, uh, on board. And <clears throat> we need to really show them that this actually strengthens their party. Now, in the whole picture of things, it doesn't necessarily do that. But it's an argument that I think is a compelling argument for them as one of our stakeholder groups that we need to convince. They're obviously very powerful group. Okay, so we're gonna say, you're consolidating your primary voters' will into the strongest possible candidate that's gonna go into the general. You want this reform in your primaries because it strengthens the party, you're gonna get the best candidate. Okay, next. This is a, a, an argument for um, communities of color, uh, traditionally marginalized communities, um, who in Boston now, the new Boston, we're talking about now it's a minority majority city, which is exciting. 
and should mean that in our politics that should be reflected. Um, next slide. Yet all these candidates of color ran, and we have two white Irish men uh, that won the top two yet again. Next. Because our candidates of color, now I'm, I'm using very raw identity politics. It's never that simple, but I'm using it for purposes of an example. And we do know that many voters do vote on, along identity lines. So there's some validity to it. I, you know, philosophically, I have some issues with it, of course. I'm sure many of this room. But it works as an example. So instead of progress, and this is the, the big paradox of our plurality system. <clears throat> the more voters start to coalesce around a platform, a set of issues, a shared identity, then it follows that the more candidates are going to run to represent that coalescence. And then it follows that the more that run under our current system, the more they punish and weaken each other by splitting up that common voting block. Paradoxical. Instead of strength, instead of saying more people want it, then it gets more strength during the campaign. It gets weakened and split up. So there was talk of Charlotte Gullar Ritchie in the bottom left corner here, the strongest candidate uh, from the community. Um, her, some folks around her campaign were pressuring other candidates of color to drop out and make way for her. Next slide. Derek Jackson at the Boston Globe said, don't do that. Asking candidates of color to drop out would also be a denial of the new Boston that activists always wanted to see. People of color are now 53% majority, so let democracy happen. So we're getting the opposite effect that we should because of our system. So we're blaming candidates, we're blaming other people. Don't, don't run, you're gonna be a spoiler, we're gonna hate you for the rest of your career. But it's the system. And there's that last point, um, rewards negative campaigning, I'm gonna get into that in a second. All right, so the solution, ranked choice voting, allows you to vote for multiple candidates in the order you prefer them. You get to rank your choices, first choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. There's kind of a sample ballot here, pretty simple bubble system. Another way to put it is you still get to vote how you vote now. You get to vote for your favorite, but you also get a series of backup votes after your first choice. So first choice, and then you get to vote for your kind of plan B, plan C, et cetera. Uh, keep going. <clears throat> So those Nader voters in Florida in 2000 could have voted Nader, choice one. Gore, choice two. Nader gets eliminated because he's the lowest vote getter. Those voters' votes transfer to their second choice and that gets added to Gore. So instead of vote splitting, we have vote consolidation. We, we, remain, we, keep, we keep the integrity of a common voting block, let it reflect accurately in the campaign itself, in the numbers. Here's an, interesting scenario. So ranked choice voting would have allowed Bernie Sanders to run as an independent in the general without hurting Hillary Clinton would have changed the history of the country and probably the planet. <clears throat> Same thing here. Rank all your candidates that you that are kind of similar or that you agree with and then as people get eliminated your votes just keep transferring and then people will get over that threshold we would have had a different outcome more reflective of the new Boston. The other, thing, the other benefit of doing this at the local level is we have these runoff. We have a preliminary, and then you get the top two for the final election. When you use ranked choice voting, it's like a series of runoffs that's happening on the ballot. So it's happening in a single election. So you're saving the municipality money because they only need one election with higher turnout rather than two. With lower turnout, where we're splitting up who's going to come to what election. Yeah. <coughs> Counting the votes. If we have an election under ranked choice voting and we've counted everyone's first choice vote, that's always the first step, you count everyone's first choice vote. If anyone has gotten a majority, the election is over. It's done, you don't go into other people's, people's other rankings. That's the goal of the program, is to, win, is to ensure we have majority rules. So in this case, the election's over, the orange, bold orange wins with 55%. If no one gets a majority, things are a little bit different. You eliminate the last place candidate and you transfer their votes to those voters' second choice. In this case, I've kept it very simple. Voters can have all sorts of different second choices. I've, in this example, I'm saying all those voters wanted light orange, they wanted bold orange second. So you eliminate light orange and you see we're transferring that 5% to the bold orange 
and they're starting to pick up steam now. Now we, do it, if, now we look again. If no one gets a majority, we do it again. We eliminate the last place candidate, and we transfer those voters' votes to their next choice. Light purple goes to dark purple. And look at here, round three. So we've, we've gotten a richer expression of voters' sentiments about the candidates. We've gotten a good broad base, and we've measured the passion because we've gotten the highest possible rankings for the highest number of people to finally pick the majority winner. Different outcome. Under plurality, we would have had bold orange. But as you see, they're less favored by the top rankings of the voters. Now we're getting the right outcome. Next. OK, next. Oh, yeah, so this is just the same example. Here, hold on. Same example with it. OK. <clears throat> In our current system, we all know that our politics is broken, our campaigns are low information, there are more heat than light, the character assassination, they're toxic, uh, there's hyperbole, there's lies, mudslinging. With ranked choice voting, <clears throat> this would all change. In our current system, the science of winning a campaign is, the rule is differentiate yourself from your opponents. You want to make yourself look different so that you get, you appeal to your base and then enough swing voters to win. And that leads to the incentive you have there is to differentiate yourself to the point where you're putting down your opponent and you're showing them to be scandalous, you're showing them to be unfit or whatever you want to do. <clears throat> With ranked choice voting, because you can pick up everyone's, everyone's second choice vote, even if you're not their favorite, you don't want to knock on someone's door, a voter's door, and say, provide some kind of hit piece against your opponent. Instead, you say, you know, Mrs. Jones, I know that I'm not your first. Um, my opponent is your first choice, but we have this, this, this in common, so I would love to get your second choice on your ballot. Completely different conversation, completely different culture for our campaigns. You're incentivized to be positive, to reach across different differences and to find the common threads, because if I were to mudsling, she's going to hate me and she's not going to vote me second. Okay, ballots, sample ballots. Here's one from Tacoma Park, Maryland. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. San Francisco has been using it for, since 04. So the system eliminates spoilers and vote splitting. It encourages more candidates to run. They're not pressured to stay out. And it encourages more positive campaigning. It gives us, the voter, more voices and more choices. And we can transform politics here. So it's used all over the country. And uh, raise your hand if you know what happened in Maine in November that you think I might be interested in. All right. Maine became the first state in U.S. history to pass this statewide. All state and federal contests, with the exception of president, because of the, uh, you're picking delegates uh, to, to the president, so it's a little complicated for that at this point. But we have to walk until we can run. So passing this for lower level offices is a huge achievement. Um, the fact that the first state just instituted this, or is about to, the voters passed in question five, means that it, it raises its visibility. It means that it's doable to pass this statewide. And after that happened in Maine, we were making some calls um, for that campaign as well to help it, help it go. Um, I called a strategy session, uh, and we had 54 people come out. And, um, and um, we had a, a great level of interest in this, and I decided, you know, we, we should try to do this here. Uh, and since then, it's been really good. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. So RCV, go back a little, uh, right here. Yeah, it's used for, to pick the best picture in the Oscars, used at many colleges and universities, National Association of Women, American Political Science Association, et cetera. <clears throat> Australia for over a de uh, century for federal elections. Ireland elect president, London for mayor. Okay, so our campaign, so yeah, we got 54 people out um, for that first meeting in November. I picked some, well, we, we kind of went around and people designated themselves team leads. They have their own members. We're using online platform Basecamp uh, to manage our work. We aggressively go out to events and sign up new people. So I, we have some sign-up sheets here if you guys are interested in getting involved. Um, we've grown our movement from a mailing list of 120 people, 100, no, 230 people. Um, to, at, to date, we have 3,500 people on our list, and we're growing. And we've raised some money. Uh, we've raised about $25,000 so far. 
uh, we're doing our first order of business at a high level is to keep these conversations going with Repos and others and to run a comprehensive statewide message poll. Um, when you do a ballot question, you have to be very data driven. Don't go in a campaign to lose. Don't just do it for the sake of doing it. A lot of activists just do stuff because they just like it, they believe in it. Be strategic. Uh, we're going into the field um, with, armed with understanding how voters feel about this, what kinds of messages resonate, the pro and con arguments, so that we know what will work. And if our numbers are good, we're, we're gonna go for the uh, statewide ballot in 18, 2018. If our numbers are not good, we could do uh, a local campaign in Amherst, we could do, um, we could build our organization and then, and then um, work for 2020 uh, ballot question. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's, that's it. Sorry I went on a really long time. Any questions? Unless we're doing that at the end, and Joe we'll has been, you've been waiting very patiently, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries, no worries. Um, my, uh, my speech, is a little, or my talk, is a little bit more selfish, because I'm just going to be mainly talking about myself and why I'm doing this, but uh, if we could just give ourselves a quick round of applause for everyone who speaks today. I mean, and of course, for people who have also organized this, uh, poor Steve has had to put up with me so much. So. Um, but, uh, so, <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. So my name is Joseph Onorowski, and I'm just a regular guy. I have a kid, I have a better half, and uh, as most people, my situation, they mean the world to me. Um, but that's not really the reason why I come before you today. Um, with all the problems that we face today, one of the biggest problems is the crushing weight of time, plus pressure from forces that would want to exert more control over us, and really for their own gain. Um, if we don't stand together and really push back against these forces, then we will find ourselves in a worse situation than ever before. When you ask most people what type of government the West has, they would say democracy, but for those of us who are politically active, we know better. Uh, and I've also had my eyes opened up to the injustices that have been presented to us in our daily grind. Um, so let me, I'm sorry, let me rewind back a little bit, uh, give a little bit of background on myself. I'm an entrepreneur by profession. And uh, I've sold everything from sodas when I was a kid in school to video games through my college years. Uh, and then now I run a small company and I help my friend manage his. So I'm still very new to the whole political situation, but I'm always looking for a solution that would be profitable for myself and ways to create jobs in the process. Um, I've always approached life that people are good by nature. Uh, I think everyone has a good in them and they're just looking. And a lot of the times what happens is um, they have needs, they have problems, so when you don't meet someone's needs, that's when things start degrading into a darker situation that operates the crime and things of that nature. Um, and don't get me wrong, some of my ventures have not been successful, some have, um, but I've definitely enjoyed it no matter how stressful it's ever gotten. Um, so really, let me just take a moment to tell you why I humbly am going for office. And it really goes back to a really famous quote by The Social Contract by Jacques Rousseau. A man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. One man thinks himself master of others, but remains more of a slave than they are. And this is actually a quote for, from England in that same book. The people of England regard itself as free, but is grossly mistaken. It is only free during the election of members of parliament. As soon as they are elected, slavery overtakes it and it is nothing. I don't pretend to be the man with all the answers. In fact, far from it, I can get all the help that I can get I, and I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, I do plan, however, on standing on the shoulders of giants. What stands before us is an unprecedented level of impression creeping up. <clears throat> but it also gives us the opportunity to rise above this and continue pushing the envelope until we are all free. I, I don't pretend to be Washington going across the Hudson in the middle of the night, nor do I pretend to be Lincoln fighting for the freedoms of all of those who don't have a voice. What I speak to is the more subtle and sinister forms of oppression. 
I'm talking about something so subtle that our forebears knew existed, but did not have the knowledge to break us free from those bonds. I could not be more grateful for those men who gave their lives and the ultimate sacrifice in order to present us with these opportunities today. What I am looking to do with this opportunity is to peacefully push for the rights to vote on what matters most to us. And how I propose to do this is, <clears throat> sorry, how I propose to do this is by trying to open up the ballot so that we can write our own questions in there. One thing that I have learned over the years is that the person who controls the questions controls the conversation. And so long, I believe it was spoken earlier today about how when we tried to put something, I think it was question four, um, how the elected officials changed the question and they controlled the conversation. So what I propose is to actually have the people propose the questions. And it might be something a little bit extreme, but I'm willing to work and get any help I can on that. So it would be in this particular situation, it would be the responsibility of the elected officials to ensure that people are educated on the greatest decisions that they need to make. We have a collective duty to make sure that things are done right, and it's time we stand up together to ensure that these things are done right. And this also actually brings me to the other major thing that I'm campaigning for, which is to have open and timely access to all information of our government, by our government, and about our government. We the people cannot make informed decisions if we do not have all the facts and information. So often secrets are kept for our security of the people, but do you feel secure? I don't. That is why we need to know what it is that's going to be our greatest threat so we can address it and stand together. This is not a request, this is a must, and if we don't understand our government, how can we be informed about the choices ourselves? <clears throat> so, and this actually falls into something I was discussing with Steve, which is what I am now going to dub spaghetti laws, uh, which is slowly becoming a larger issue and should be addressed. <clears throat> um, and yes, I took the idea of spaghetti code and made it into my own thing. So, as some of you may know what spaghetti code is, um, it's essentially code that's become so convoluted and so difficult for us to understand that it's just, it's hard to understand how we even came to that point. And a good point to this is the blue laws, but the fact that we now need lawyers in order to understand laws about criminal business and all this, whereas it makes it so complicated for those laws to be understood that it's hard for us to be in compliance with it. The most well-intentioned and good person before you could be in violation and thus persecuted for those laws and for those reasonings. So uh, I think this needs to be addressed, so that's a very ambitious goal. And so in order to address this, it's such a huge monumental task, especially with the way legislation is done nowadays, that there is another simpler solution, which is education reform. And <clears throat> so with education reform, um, it's, it's a really difficult thing, but they say that a genius is born in every generation, and what we need to do is find a, do a better job in finding and pushing those kids to the fullest potential that they have. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I got a little bit off track. I tend to get off track from time to time because I can just be up here and just talk and talk and talk. and. Um, and these are things I feel very passionately about. But there was a lot of talk about question two. And really what I'm speaking to was question two, where it was, should we give more money to charter schools or should we give more money to the schools? And my whole thought behind this is to take what is best about both schools and incorporate into one school so that we are taking that money and we're pushing it to its maximum. So that way we are doing the best situation for every student, not just a selected few. And that way we can go and find those geniuses to help innovate, to help be better for businesses. And so, in conclusion, I am still very new to this whole political arena. 
uh, which is why I'm going to need help from all of you, your support, your guidance, in order to help formulate the details of a really good actionable plan, which will best benefit us all. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I'm running for, oh, I'm sorry. I am actually going small. I am just looking to go for city council. I would like to eventually go for state representative, but uh, low mass. Uh, I'm going for the 2019 election. I want to have a lot of time to really formulate and make sure that all of my plans really, really are well sounded and well thought out, as opposed to in a few months. So, but uh, it, I would just, again, I want to make sure that we're right on point, that we're helping address a lot of the issues of the political party and things of that nature. Um, I will be creating a website uh, and posting this up to it. It would be Joseph P. Onorowski. Um And I'll, I'll share it with Steve so that we can share it with everybody. But I really appreciate that. Are you running as a pirate? Yes, sir. In fact, when I was looking at all the, po all the different Google political, I was originally a libertarian, and, but I think the, really the goals of the pirate party truly are 100% in line with what I want to, be, want to represent. I want to represent a fairer democracy, and I want to push that democracy envelope. So, um, and I think that in order to create an opportunity where we, the people, get to speak. So. Actually, I have a question. For, so yeah. what offices are you guys running for? Uh, so I ran for state rep last year. We didn't spend too much money. We did a uh, very low budget, about twelve, fifteen hundred dollars actually. Oh, $1,500. fifteen hundred. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's yeah. a thousand. Yeah. So it's not something that needs to be. You can do it. I mean, thirteen percent, very popular state rep we ran against. What district? Um, it was uh, twenty-seven, so it was Provo. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but she's been. Uh, you know, I ran very pro question four, and she was already pretty pro marijuana, but. Um, after the election, she was right on top of Mass Can and working hand in hand with them. Yeah, it was. Um, so I, I'm so that, that, that was kind of cool just to, uh, to feel like, you know, she felt a little bit of pressure there. Yeah. She introduced the bill on Mass Can's behalf uh, that pretty much was everything they were looking for. And so, you know, even if you run and lose, you do you know your opponents know you're there. Uh, my main point is. I realized, first I realized what was happening to Sanders. Uh, he had very little chance at winning that Democrat nomination. I was a Sanders supporter. Uh, and then I also realized that there wasn't anyone going to be running against my state rep. And I believe in competitive elections. So I wanted a choice for state rep. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to have a choice. So I said, I'll run and create a choice. Yes. So that's, that's how it went, and I'm um, keeping my doors open for down the road, but it was a good experience. And Connolly ran twice, and lost twice. Connolly, yeah. And then on his third try, he beat Toomey. And, yeah. I'm, I'm probably be a little more hesitant, too. I like Connolly. I do like Connolly. I'll be a little more hesitant. I'm, I have no intentions of joining the Democrat Party. Oh, no, no, we're talking about, yeah, I'm just talking about, like, you can do it, but it might take a few tries. Like you, I, I want to see folks do it without having to join the Democrat Party. Oh, I see. I see. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, we might things. fail a couple of times. Uh, not fail. We might not win. Uh, but I, I do believe winning is breaking open the two-party system, uh, one-party system here in Massachusetts, and that by jo joining it and winning, you're only accomplishing so much, although I do like Conley. And maybe. Um, so you're, you're running a poll um, which has a huge immigrant refugee population. Yes. Um, how, how do your, uh, your ideals align with that community? Um, well, honestly, 
they're oftentimes when they're immigrating and they're trying to get away from the worst situations that they are in, um, when they come to Lowell, uh, Lowell is a very diverse place, uh, very, very diverse. And they bring their richness with them as far as their cultures. And it has done nothing but enhance uh, Lowell. So um, I, I remember back when I was younger, Lowell was a much rougher place. But with all the influx of all the immigrants into the city, is helped breathe a new life into the city. And that, with the ability to uh, clean up the crime and clean up a lot of the problems that we face. And we don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of problems in Lowell, but I think that it's brought such a richness of culture that you could have a conversation with everybody all the time. And, and honestly, it's just, I, I've learned so many different cultures from Brazilian to people from Africa. And it's, I just, I think that brings such a, a goodness with it. I don't know if that's necessarily answering your question, but... Um, I think she's getting to... That's my girlfriend, too, Yvette. <laughs> um, but I think she's getting to a uh, lesson, too, that, we, that uh, we learned last year, too, is given that you have some time here, is really trying to connect with the community. Mm -hmm. um, Would maybe, you? maybe that's something... And you grew up there, but I'm not saying that you don't, but just really... The more you can connect with your community over the next two years, and it's not really so much her question, but the more you can, that those questions are going to come up, yes. the more you can, better you can answer those questions, the better tune your campaign and, will be. And like I said, I can use all the help I can get. <laughs> uh, I mean, I would say, you know, working with Aaron on his campaign, um, he's been really good about connecting with the media folks the I mean one of the beautiful things in law we have a local uh, TV station which actually runs three stations but we actually have a day where it's a low folk festival which is just phenomenal where every culture brings in their own food and oh my god I get so fat on that day <laughs> it's fantastic and then you actually get to have the conversations and learn about all these different cultures um, Actually, some of the food is a little bit too spicy. The Cambodian food's a, a little bit too spicy for my taste, but it, it is phenomenal. Um, and it's just a phenomenal opportunity to really meet and greet a lot of people. So. Have you been on there yet? Uh, with? The local media? Uh, yes, for, my, for one of my businesses, yes. Um, the last time I was on that local media was for a gaming company that I had. And before the gaming company really went belly up, um, I was on public access a couple times. It was definitely, so, I would think, when you decide to announce publicly, which it sounds like you kind of have. Yes. Um, but the more you can get on there, the better for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm hoping over the course of the next two years, I can really start bringing some of the local issues to forefront. I know right now uh, the big talk in, in our local scene is about the new high school, how we're going to fund it, where is it going to go, things of that nature. So, I mean, that's kind of taking the majority of the views. but. There's still a lot of uh, major issues that need to be addressed. Another thing that's very tough, which I didn't get down, is somehow making this fun. Like people, like it's such a drag to think of the idea of running for office or getting active in politics. It's, it's most people. It's it's to somehow make a campaign fun. It's easier said than done. Mm. But ways to think of that, especially when you you know you're on a low budget, you don't have money to be renting out halls and whatnot. Um, there's still somehow canvassing, going door to door, volunteering, doing that work is only so much fun. <laughs> it's, uh, so if I could that's, add to that, if you're interested in winning, I mean, I would, I would really try to hook up with political consultants and strategists who know how to win campaigns. Because there's everything you do in a campaign, because you always have limited time, volunteer time, your own time, and money. That's where money comes All from. your reason no, I mean, it's not necessarily the replacement for it. I'm saying each is a resource. Time is a resource, money is a resource, all resource. Yeah. And because of that, you can do lots of things, but they literally could be the wrong thing, or you're getting a return on that resource investment that is a fraction of what you get if you do this other thing. That's the right thing. The, the information I've picked up, we, we, we work for our campaign here, 
gentleman named Dan Cohen, who's a who's a pretty well known political strategist around Massachusetts. He's worked for thirty years. He's won hundreds of campaigns. He's never lost a local ballot measure. Any third parties? Oh yeah, yeah. He helped Green. Uh, he helped Jill Stein run. Green. Well, I mean, has he won any third party campaigns? Well, no, because almost none. I mean, most people don't run. That's the challenge. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah. but the the rules of winning a campaign, guys, they're universal. It's not like. It's not like if you're a third party, you got to do it like this. And if you're particularly well, no, I'm just saying with the third party, the, quest, the question marks as to how to win get a little more difficult. Not this is, my point is is actually not, and don't don't use that as like a stigma or a barrier. Voters care about stuff going on. They're not as long as you can do. So basically, the point I'm getting at is from what I've gleaned from Dan and other strategists, doing doors, one-on-one -on -one voter contact is yep. the most important important thing to do. That's how we got 13%. And you know that, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And you cut up your turf, you calculate how many votes you need to win, and you just get out there for hours a day. And you start to just turn people onto your campaign. Bit by bit, person by person by person, you start to build power. And even if you lose, if you get 12%, 15%, 35%, 35 if it's growing when you try to do it the next cycle, you know that you're doing something right. And then third or fourth time, boom. We're gonna get finally a non-major party candidate elected. It'll be awesome. Jill Stein got 35 percent of the vote, I think. She ran for state rep seat in Waltham. No, I think we got better she, numbers than you. When she, was you this? Were part of that? This is oh, 15 no, years. No, I think ago. she only got like four or five. Uh, we have a no, 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 she got yeah. No. All right, then, one one more question, then uh, we'll have to move on. <laughs> kind of fun. Yeah. I don't know. You. Let's do it too, Nick. Quick, quick. He's a consultant here. And he helped a lot of Mike. Uh, anybody who's running or thinking of running, um, early voting, we hit a brick wall. I, I mean, yeah, Aaron, early we, voting. We hit a brick wall for that last two weeks. Um, in terms of we, we hit somebody's door. And they already voted. And, and that, yeah. So you got to do it before. Um, That's all. That's oh, just yeah. hit it. Just go way before. Fine question. Yeah, no, yeah, that's a good question. I already know what this answer is, but um, in regards to gun control, do you guys feel that there's any position that would be better? I'm more uh, conservative with that myself, uh, and I believe the Pirate Party. We're very try not to get too ideological, but we have a lot of gun proponents here. Um, so we definitely feel like that it's people that kill. I feel like that it's people that kill people, and I think there's other pirates that feel that way. Although it's not a, we try to remain an open party, but I know that there are many gun advocates uh, within the party. Yes. Uh, him saying he's a libertarian, I kind of felt like, you know, which way you guys are going. Former with. libertarian. <laughs> I'm, now a, I'm now a full on pirate. And that's not to say there aren't people who are for gun control who are pirates. You know, we try to we'll try to be as open as possible, but I feel like there's more people who are a little like, ah, it's people that kill people.